Tan chi to Tapway Talk, a mischief kitchen party with Jamie Morse. Bonjour à Causerie Tapway, a party cuisine mischief avec Jamie Morse. Tapway Talks are free flowing conversation with artists, and we would love to hear from you. At the bottom of your screen, you will find an icon for question and answers. We encourage you to add your questions in there, at, and as the conversation progresses, we'll try to answer them as we go or at the end of the conversation. I'm Ariane Rudai, a co-host for this Tapway Talk, as well as an interpreter guide at the National Gallery of Canada. I am a Métis from the Red River Valley in Treaty No. 1, which is now known as Manitoba. I am also a guest here in Ottawa, as is the National Gallery of Canada. And so we recognize that we stand on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continues to nurture the land. Uh, they are the keepers and defenders of the Ottawa River watershed. I honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this territory. And I recognize that I'm a guest to the Omami Wininiwag and their land. And as a guest, I am committed to defend and promote the voice and values of my host nation. And one of the ways that I do that is by educating myself on the issues in the area. And right now with spring arriving, I can't help but think of the uncovering of the earth. The thaw of the snow and the bare ground that we see makes me think of the green that is to come or that is already poking through the dead leaves from last fall. These little sprouts of life remind me of the beautiful diversity of, of our ecosystems. And I'm reminded of the native plants and how they have nourished our ancestors and wildlife and continue to do so. But I'm also reminded of the threats of these, to these native species. The invasive plants that are sold in greenhouses that are now overtaking the spaces just outside of our cities. And I'm also reminded of this, that the seasons for foraging are starting. And I think of the ways our ancestors would um, thank Mother Earth as they harvested whatever that was given to them. And how we continue to her to honor her in sustainably harvesting. So I'm going to add a couple of links in the chat for you to, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about non-invasive or native plants and non-invasive species that you can choose from at the greenhouse as you start thinking about your garden and how to harvest sustainably. And now I'm gonna finally introduce our guests. Uh, we have Skina Rees, who is Tiam Shien Gitzgan and Métis Cree artist from the west coast of BC. She has garnered national and international attention for mo and most notably for Raven on the colonial fleet. Her bold installation and performance work presented as part of the celebrated group exhibition, uh, Beat Nation. Her multidis multidisciplinary practice includes performance art, spoken word, humor, sacred clowning, writing, singing, songwriting, video, and visual art. She studied media arts at Emily Carr Institute of Art and Design and was the recipient of the BC Award for Excellence in the Art in 2012 and the Viva Award in 2014. For her work on Savage in 2010, in collaboration with Lisa Jackson, Reese won a Leo Award for the Best Short Film, Golden Sheaf Award for Best Multicultural Film, Real World Outstanding Canadian uh, Short Film, Leo Award for Best Actress and Best Editing. She participated in the 17th Sydney Biennial in Australia, and her recent exhibitions include The Sacred, Sacred Cat Clown and Other Strangers, a solo exhibition of her performance costumes and documentation as at Urban Shaman Contemporary Aboriginal Art in Winnipeg and Moss Oboro Gallery in Montreal. Recent so solo show at James Madison University in Virginia. And our other guest, Laurie Blondeau, is an interdisciplinary artist working primarily in performance and photography. She is Cree Sauter Métis from Saskatchewan. Her mother is Cree Sauter from George Gordon First Nation, located in Treaty 4, and her late father was Métis from Lombre, uh, Saskatchewan. Blondeau holds a, an FA uh, from the University of Saskatchewan. In addition to her extensive exhibition history, Blondeau is co-founder of the Indigenous Artists Collective Tribe, and has sat on the advisory panel for the Visual Arts for the Canada Council for the Arts. Laurie has exhibited and performed nationally and internationally, including at the Banff Centre Mendel Art Gallery, Saskatoon Open Space, Victoria and FOFA 
uh, in Montreal. In 2007, Laurie was part of the requickening project with artist Shelley Nero and the at the Venice Venice Biennial. She recently was a, had a solo exhibition at Urban Shaman Contemporary Aboriginal Art Gallery in Winnipeg and was part of the Scotia Bank Contact Festival in Toronto. Her art is held in both public galleries and private collections. And lastly, I'd like to introduce you to our host, Jamie Morse, uh, Indigenous Educator for Indigenous Programs and Outreach. So welcome, everyone. Thank you, Ariane. That was really nice. That was, um, um, you know, a thoughtful way to think about um, some of the topics that we're going to um, chat about today with Skina, and Lori, and Ariane. And um, the, the topic or the theme that we chose was uh, grieving as healing. And when we had our, our test connection yesterday, Skina asked, well, what did you know, what was your intention? And I was like, oh, yeah, we did this. We took, we, you know, we, we talked about these topics last year. What was my intention at the time? And we were, you know, coming up, we were like, not sure it was going to be a whole year of COVID. And throughout the, the whole time, you know, people have had to grieve, um, whether that be like grieving relationships or grieving community or even the community gatherings that we have together. Um, grieving our creativity uh, in some ways. And, and that's something else that we talked about yesterday was um, touch, like grieving the touch, you know, of other people and the human interaction and hugs and, you know, face-to-face -face conversations and just, you know, being around people in proximity in the kitchen or whatever it is. Um, so, um, you know, for me, uh, Grieving came in the form of um, one day just like blasting my 80s music from back home and jumping in the shower and singing to the top of my lungs and realizing that, you know, I just like broke out in big sobs and that was how I didn't even realize I needed to do that. And so I just let it happen. Um, and it was such a big weight off my shoulders. And it's, you know, it's it's interesting that you know, as a side note, in some ways, um, to this panel, um, there's the, the funeral of Prince Philip today. And uh, so there's different kinds of, of grieving. And I wonder if there's any healing in that for anyone and um, in some small way. Um, so I guess um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask um, both Lori and Skina, um, and welcome to Tapway Talks. Tapway, um, it's about it's about truths, um, and so it's about your truths. And um, we're really looking forward to hearing about some of uh, the ways in which you manage uh, grief, or you have managed grief throughout this time or bef you, before COVID time, you know, we have the before and after. Um, yeah, so I wanted to open it up um, to both of you, maybe, uh, you know, to talk about how grief helps with, or how, how, how grief is expressed for you. For some, it's like humor, for some, it's cooking. Um, you know, there's, a, there's some, yeah, so I'll leave it to, to you, um, either Lori or Skina, to, to start it off. First of all, hi, everybody. <laughs> hi. You in this. Thanks for inviting me. I know last time I was, uh, uh, I thought it was one o'clock Pacific time. So it's like I, I, I hijacked this one. <laughs> no, you <laughs> didn't. <laughs> Welcome it. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. It's it's hard to say that there's any kind of like stopping in grieving. I feel like I'm perpetually grieving, and my art practice is all about that. So I don't really feel like there's any pause. <laughs> I feel like I'm just like. I think over the years, obviously, there's a progression or a, you know, a, a way in which I, I grieved in the past and how I grieve now is totally different. So I think that um, an intensity of feeling 
is probably all I pretty much do to grieve. And so how that manifests is, if you would call it coping, uh, I would say I watch a lot of YouTube videos <laughs> to cry. I think I've seen thousands of like unexpected results, uh, talent shows of like, uh, like Susan Boyle. It's like everybody's dissing her and then all of a sudden she's amazing and we're like, oh my God, she's amazing. I can't believe I judged her. RuPaul drags, Ru RuPaul's drag race. I don't know. That's fun too, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's anything from uh, going to the beach. Uh, I feel like making my kids happy is pretty much something that feeds me too. So I've got like a seven and nine-year-old and yeah. obviously I'm constantly putting them in a position to play or to be in open spaces. So that is also residual sort of uh, healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also teach parenting classes, which is uh, nourishing because I feel like I always constantly need, uh, you know, some bolstering up to keep going because it's a lot of work. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I just feel like getting feedback from other parents is so nourishing to me right now because I mean we're all holed up and I don't feel like I'm really accomplishing any great things I feel like I'm in a creative vacuum and that sort of also mm -hmm. makes me feel grief uh, unable to access or end or do my artistic practice freely so yeah that that's hard because that's my main source of expression yeah yeah, I, I was thinking about all of the opportunities lost, you know, too, that artists have to grieve. Mm. Yeah, especially performances. Yeah, yeah, people. I've made a conscious choice not to um, do online performances, which I know there's a lot of performance artists who have chosen to do that. But I just um, made the conscious choice not to do it. I recently remounted a performance for the Winnipeg Art Gallery for a show Jamie Isaac curated called Born in Power, but we videotaped it and then kind of edited it a bit and that's just being streamed. But, um, and it felt like I was doing a performance, <laughs> but the, it, I didn't think it was gonna feel how usually I feel after I do a performance and it's a performance um, called Are You My Mother? It's based on a story from my mother's residential school experience. And I've only done the piece three times. After the first time, I didn't think I'd ever do it again, which was in 2002, um, which when I think of grief uh, and her experience and her survival of the residential school, like she still is um, working through that after, you know, so many years. Today's her birthday. She's turning 88. So nice. Um, I just think of her uh, survival and her resilience mm -hmm. and her strength and then how that transferred over to us as her children. And I'm sure that's transferring over onto my children, but it's, I think, getting less and less. Mm -hmm. um, I just thinking, am I grieving performance? I don't know. Um, I miss it. Uh, but when I remounted this piece a few weeks ago, uh, there was five people, three, three video people, and then my assistant and Jamie that watched it. And it felt like performing, you know, do it like, because I didn't think I'd have an audience, right? And audience mm -hmm. to me is very important when it comes to performance art. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I was exhausted after, so it... So it's like a performance, yeah. We had one here the other day. Um, my kids have a dance group um, called Prairie Fire. And, you know, we pushed out the um, kitchen table um, and we, we did do an online performance. And I know that, like, for, for us, it was an opportunity for me to just, like, dance with my kids. You know, and, like, how many like in a like in a dance that we know and we've practiced together and 
even though we didn't have an audience, you know, I think we had, well, Blaze, Blaze was there and he's two, um, you know, and he got all dressed up. So it was like a, a little event. And um, it was, if anything, a chance for me to just like see my teenagers because I never get to see them. <laughs> so um, for me, performance works out uh, for selfish reasons um, just so I could see my kids more often. Yeah, but I mean, there's still, there's still that, you know, you don't get the stage, you don't get the like exact, you know, the, the feeling of, of what it feels like to, to go on stage. But yeah, I, I was thinking about um, uh, Skeena and your um, recent work with Sandra Semchuk, who we had on uh, our last Tapway Talks. And um, it's, just a, it's just a beautiful piece. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let you explain it if you want. Um, and then, yeah, I just wanted to share with you and some of our viewers my experience with your art yeah you mean the video the video of us oh yeah uh well <clears throat> just um basically it came from another idea so uh there was a curator at the western front who's no longer there now and uh basically she she's i think she's at, in calgary but she, she was like, uh, what, you know, in your dream of dreams, what would you do? And so I said, I, I kind of want to honor like a, an older performance artist. I, I want to bathe them as an honoring. And um, she said, that sounds good. And she went back to Western Front and they said, we, we don't want water in the space. So I wanted it like a huge tub and to do this whole thing live mm -hmm. and so that got put on the back burner for like two or three years and then when I was approached by the Belkin uh, they did a show called Native Art in Canada's Residential Schools and I kind of just felt like I didn't have a first person narrative I didn't feel comfortable sharing like say my mom's story or my dad's so uh, something that touches me as a second generation is her inability to touch me at the age of eight on. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I, we attribute this to the, the, that's when she was taken. And mm -hmm. so yeah. from then on, you know, she was sort of on her own, you know what I mean? So, uh, and then I think she just, the, the disconnection and the inability to mother to, to have that mothering to her uh, maybe disabled her ability to attach. So, I mean, as deep and as maybe like uh, exposing as that is, I think that it's just important for us to kind of remember, well, what are our, you know, what, what are our things that sort of drive us to do what we're doing? And so for me, it was a healing act to uh, bathe another person. I've also seen um, Jewish women uh, do a ceremony, I believe, where they bathe one another in like a respectful kind of act. I don't know if it's before uh, before doing something in particular, like religiously or what, but it just is a beautiful act. And of course, um, when you have your last moments with somebody you love and you're bathing their body, their corpse, mm -hmm. uh, there's just something very intimate about that. And so, um, and not just, you know, uh, just that, like it was a story that my brother shared with me who, and allowed me to share um, because it was a part of our healing in terms of letting my dad go. Yeah. yeah. And so, <clears throat> uh, I was going to be nine months pregnant with my second child and um, I said I can't perform but if you want I can I can videotape something for you and and so the Belkin uh, uh, paid for it all and my dream team of friends uh, enabled me to kind of dream up this scheme where I just said I want everything to to be all about the gesture of care and so please just like uh videotape um facial expressions we're not we didn't have a script so it was just like I, I just want you to just kind of get all the body language that you can and try to be as you know unintrusive as possible with the camera so we had a wide and then we had one guy on the ground like just like catching everything 
but it was so quiet and it was it was just like the perfect day uh we did it at vivo the old video in video out place uh studio and you know i just got really expensive soap and a beautiful east indian uh copper vessel I was like I just want to use copper for the vessel because mm -hmm. of where I come from and um and yeah we captured a really beautiful film if you didn't see it it's just like a lot of water sounds and you know um I bathed her hands I think I did her feet and it just looks so cute I didn't want her to feel exposed obviously it's a you know it's a, it's a document. So I just wrapped her whole body with like an organic um, piece of cotton. And then I ran out and got something I thought looked kind of okay mm -hmm. from, the, um, uh, I think it was Motherland, one of those pregnancy places. And uh, yeah, just looked pretty muted and wanted to focus on our interaction. And I think the whole thing took about 23 minutes maybe 30 minutes and then they cut it down to about 13 so um yeah. mm -hmm. i think we did one or two takes you know what i mean like kind of going back and redoing the camera but yeah and it was very very organic i don't know <laughs> Well, I know that when I went into the space where I saw it was um, during Abadakwane and it was, it had its uh, entire own enclosed room with double doors so that um, when you went in, it was uh, really um, private and intimate. And right away, there's like a feeling of intimacy, which it was comforted, you know, kind of in the space. And um, it was like, it was just like, it captivated me. And so I would, I was just, you know, there watching it. And um, it was, I don't even remember what part I was watching, um, but, you know, there was a point where I started to think about my own mom who um, is a white woman. Um, and I, I thought about it from that, from that way. Um, and me being an Indigenous kid of hers um, and bathing me, you know, and, and her having to take care of me. And then also that loss of intimacy, too, um, and how, you know, we manage that. It's something, you know, there's always something, like I said before, there's always something to, to kind of grieve. But when I guess, I guess watching your... Um, film helped me grieve you know and helped me heal and it was like you turning on you know you talked about Netflix it's obviously not the same thing but this is something that was just like really powerful and and hugged my body in every way and I just uh you know for anybody who gets to see that piece I just really hope that you know it's it's a very intimate piece I saw it at the Belkin when it was installed there and it it was quite emotional and but it, the intimacy that Skeena and, and Sandra had within that film was so powerful and beautiful. Yeah, yeah it, you saw it at the the Native uh, Art and Residential School show? Yeah. That was a show. That was a show. Yeah, that was a really, really. That was, that was, that yeah. was like a nuclear bomb yeah it was pretty it was, it was powerful um it's a small wonder that we can make art through all of this grief mm -hmm. yeah. yeah even the perpetual grief like you said Skeena that we go through um I think as indigenous people because of what has happened um you know but the fact that we're still here and we're still doing it and we're still making art and even with the loss that we've had, whether it's through cultural practices or language or, you know, some of the things that have been lost because of the institutions that were there and set up to, to create this situation where it's about, you know, um, washing that stuff out of our, our ancestors and our parents and our grandparents, and, but we're still here and we're still making art 
And I think that practice of um, making art around these very difficult subjects is something that sort of moves us forward. And, well, for myself, I guess I can only speak for myself. And um, it moves me forward to working through this stuff. Um, and when I did do um, Are You My Mother in 2002, my mom worked with me on the whole performance. Mm -hmm. And she actually came and she broke down in the middle of the performance. I had to stop mm -hmm. it. And um, my sisters were there with me. And so we took my mother into a bathroom at the gallery and I said, do you want me to stop? Because if you want me to stop, I'll stop. And she goes, no, no, you, uh, you go and finish, but I can't watch it. And then, <clears throat> you know, and it was great because I remember Louise Half being there and um, Maria Campbell and Marie Baptiste. And these are all women who also, you know, went through residential school experiences and they really um, supported my mom, like, it was quite, it was a beautiful scene, but it was very difficult to do the piece. And I did finish and it actually changed because of uh, when I went back out to finish the piece, everybody um, that was sitting in this structure that I had created, this infense structure that I was going to close and, you know, <laughs> lock them in there. In the end, I couldn't do it because everybody was crying. So mm -hmm. it changed the piece. Um, that would have been a perfect time to lock them up. <laughs> and then I remounted it in 2018 for a show at the Kenderdine College Art Gallery at the U of S and again talked to my mom and the piece obviously evolved and changed from 2002 um, and I said, asked my mom do you want to come to the opening she goes no no I'm not coming to that mm -hmm. over it <laughs> She ended up going, I took her to see the exhibition because I created an audio piece for it. So the installation and the audio piece was still there. And um, she really liked it. She didn't cry. And, you know, and she, you know, said that she really loved how it evolved because I showed her a video also of it. So, but yeah, where would, where would we be without grief? I don't know. I've been thinking about it since you asked me to be on this panel. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's a very tough, tough subject matter to talk about. And sometimes we make art not even realizing it's about grief. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's true. We have a question in the Q&A um, for Laurie about the significance of wearing red in your pieces. And that also kind of makes me think of colors and how we use colors in our grief. But, if you wouldn't mind answering the question of like the significance for you of, wear, of wearing red. Yeah, um, red is a color that I grew up with, um, with going to ceremony and stuff like grandpa, grandfather and grandmother. And um, it was just a significant color growing up within um, different ceremonies that my family would do. And, um, and it's also, it's a color of power. It's um, a color of, what I like to think life. So that's why I wear red. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about your mom being at the, you know, having her moments during your performance, do you think that there was any healing in what you did, like in the, in the performance for her? Oh, oh yeah. We've talked about it and, um, you know, and, she gets really, she got really excited about it when we were, cause it took to the first time I did the piece cause I had been thinking about the piece for about nine years before I actually did it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it, it, because it, it's sort of having those memories for her come back up and what triggered her breakdown in, in my performance was I was skinning uh, poplar trees because our whole reserve is it's the little touchwood hills in Saskatchewan second highest point besides Cypress Hills and um, so the wood that they would burn like they burned in their wood stoves and stuff was poplar and so I wanted it was about smell the performance also and it was that that's what triggered her during the performance um, 
Mm. But, wow. but no, it definitely has made her, um, I guess heal. I don't know. Sometimes I don't like using that word. Like I understand we have to heal. I understand that, but I think it just helped her move forward from those memories and sort of be able to, you know, cause she never talked about them when I was growing up. Like I didn't find out about um, like even my Kukum, like sh her first language, she spoke Cree and I never realized that until 1988, you know, and it was, um, I was living in Montreal and her and my, my mother came cause I had my second child and it was, um, they came to stay with me and it was the first time I cooked and took an airplane and um, she loved baguettes, <laughs> like by, and uh, we, that film where the spirit lives came out and we ended up watching that and just the stories my mother and my grandmother ended up telling me about residential school after we mm -hmm. watched this film, just like so many things I found out that I just didn't realize um, how it affected them because they just never talked about it. And, you know, and the fact that the last residential school to close down was on George Gordon First Nation in 1996. And mm -hmm. it, it's being torn down. Um, when that was the first school my mother went to, it was run by the Anglicans. And she's the oldest out of eight children. Um, so she was the first one to go of my grandparents' ch children. And she was starving because they didn't have a lot of money. So my grandfather converted his family to Catholic so he could send her to this other school on a couple of reserves over from ours, Muskelgan. Uh, where it was um, the Catholics, it was a Catholic school. So he converted them to Catholics so he could center there because he had heard they had more food and the kids weren't starving <laughs> as much. Yeah. And so um, she went there and that school still stands. And last summer I went to visit my mom and we went for a drive and we went to it. It's all boarded up now. But um, yeah, so she's still going through, you know, talking about it but I'm just glad she's at a point where she can because I know there's a lot of people who can't talk about their experiences within those institutions so. yeah yeah it's true there's um there's so much like recently I've noticed in the past like month or two no about about the last six weeks even um a lot of like panels like we're not the only one basically thinking about grieving and maybe maybe healing is um like you were saying skina you know I, and lori like you can never really heal like 100 percent either it's just it's, it's more about the process and and kind of like dampening or making making the memories a little less blunt um through through you know we talked about touch with skina but talking about scent is I think really relevant here too just because um how much you know how how important that scent is even in performances and um and that you put it in like purposefully because it helps people experience your artwork and um one of the one of the things that I was reminded of is the smudge you know it's from the black willow or the black willow tree diamond willow tree or whatever it is and it's a smudge and so most people have cedar sweetgrass and say uh, sage sweetgrass and tobacco um, but we we often in northern Alberta where where I'm from uh, Lac La Biche, Skeena and I were trying to make relations yesterday we we're trying to figure out who we're probably related to because uh, she's a part of her family's from up that way too but um, you burn it and we, and we burned it all the time at like funerals, we'd burn it. My grandma would burn it in her house. My grandma's German, um, but she had a close relationship with the Beaver Lake First Nation. So I was able, like, that's how I got a lot of my teachings from. And so the, the, I found out way later, like maybe six years ago, that that fungus, when you burn it, it's supposed to help with depression. 
<laughs> and so I was like, oh, this is why they burn it at funerals. This is why, you know, sometimes my grandma would have it burning. So this is something my, you know, German grandmother practiced and um, people around us. Uh, so a white farmer around First Nations and Métis settlements. And, and so there was a lot of like, a lot of, there was some, there was some, at the time there was like some good relationships. <laughs> really different now it, it, it's really different now than when I grew up um and so anyway um yeah it just it just made me think of how powerful scent is and how that can't be relayed across like a zoom meeting you know we're not in the same spaces we're not in the same exact energy it's a different kind of energy you know so so th there's all that there's all that like confusion in a way about like how how we grieve now how we interact and and all of those things but jesse wente recently spoke about um grieving and the need to put some boundaries and protection around it and i know that we all probably do that too and you know one of um your ways of what we talked about yesterday was was around humor and how you know just like not necessarily softening, but but just making grief more palatable because <laughs> sometimes it's hard to take in. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to tell jokes while you're crying though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that uh, when I was younger, I did a lot of gigs where we were like doing a whole mashup. So there was a like, cabaret and there was, um, we just mixed so many different genres of people expressing. So uh, I definitely found it super easy to, to find an audience to make laugh. And so I think I did some stand-up comedy, but I realized that half of the stuff I did was in jest anyway. So I was like, I just sort of embraced that whole sacred clowning of just thinking, I'm not telling hard or bad jokes about, you know, big things uh, to make light of it or to diminish it, but to put light on it with a sense of being able to sit with it. And um, for so many subjects, it's taboo and, um, you know, for, for to not be able to light things, it's extremely, uh, it's like trying to grieve in a vacuum. So I think for the longest time, I just sort of, you know, threw things out there just so that I could like have this sort of um, relief uh, and people seem to think that it was helpful to them too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I remember being at a party and somebody asked me, well, aren't you just like crazy because, you know, um, you're just throwing it out there or I don't know, he, he really diminished it. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm pretty sure I love people and I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm trying to draw them in to kind of be a part of this sort of relief that I get out of it. And, um, and I'm, I'm certainly not, I don't think I was as responsible in my earlier career as I am now I feel to a point where it's like almost muting my sense of humor. Cause I'm so careful. I was just like, Oh God, I don't want to damage anyone anymore and um and so and also when you have little kids they're so literal uh I can't remember yeah specific incident but uh I definitely feel like um I'm not as readily uh, able to make jokes but I mean obviously when you get together with your peers as, and you have like this ruckus moment where you're just letting things loose and saying things and it just feels so healing. Mm -hmm. And there's always one or two people in your group that you just really connect with and you're just laughing. Yeah. Away. yeah. It's like one time I, my son was being a little punk, whatever. Um, he was, he was, I don't know what he was doing. And I, and I was like, a threat. he was like, like 10 or something and I threatened to give him a licking and he's like oh gross <laughs> my, ki my kids didn't know what a licking was you know <laughs> I knew what a licking was 
and he was like 10 years old and he doesn't know and it just made me laugh but it's you know it's I know what a lichen is <laughs> so <Being> good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly so I have um I have this little kind of game that I play with people um before I get there uh this this game is like you're you're stuck in it's not too far from reality sometimes but you're stuck in the bush by yourself um like no kids just they're taken care of though and you don't have to have that worry on your mind <laughs> but you're stuck in the bush and you're you can bring with you one piece of art uh one book and one piece of music um and you don't know how long you're going to be there for it could be like years so I'll, I'll let you just start like thinking about that while we kind of close up the the topic of um grieving is healing but um yeah I wanted to know um if you either of you had anything to add wanted to that you wanted to share with the people who are watching about um, grief and healing oh. go ahead <laughs> Okay. Uh, I just wanted to sort of touch on this, uh, the idea of humor and how um, I think I've used it and I've seen how Skeena has used it in the past. I've known Skeena for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some good laughs in Banff in 2005 when we were all there together. Um, but I think humor is, uh, even before contact, has probably been a huge part of Indigenous culture. Um, and the, because I think it's just something that really um, lightens up. I, I was thinking about the late James Luna, who I mentored with in the early, late 1990s. And I was interviewing him in 1997 for Mix Magazine when it was in existence. Um, and I had asked him about how he used humor within his practice. And I said, because after experience his performance live, I remember um, he kind of would take you, he would take you up and then bring you down. He'd bring you and then bring you back up. I described it, his performance like a roller coaster. I said, you take us on an emotional roller coaster ride. And he goes, yeah, because you know, if I'm just gonna sit there and just be all draggy about everything, like nobody's gonna wanna watch my performance. And he goes, and that's how I, he looked at it by preparing his audience, by giving them that humor, and then just bringing it back with something that just took me so low. And I think that use of humor that we do, and I've seen Skeena has done it. And I think that's a technique I use within some of my performances that are more humorous um it's it's you know we're not gonna i think as performance artists we don't want to be just being negative or just even as people like what a drag <laughs> so, um, yeah. so I, I called two shows uh sweetgrass and honey and the other one honey and sweetgrass and it just is a, a recurring thing where it's just like there is this where there is poison, the medicine is right near it. You know what I mean? So there's always like a, a symbiotic sort of ability to balance. And um, I grew up with that. And my dad was a rager and he was, uh, he was dangerous, but he was also my savior and my place of comfort. <laughs> so as much as I would love to think that that was completely okay, I know that it was problematic, but in, in hindsight, he had those extremes. And in our communities, we have these extremes, but we also have the ability to heal very close to the pain. And so I think that we keep it very, you know, um, I think that we always want and have the ability to try, try to fix things uh, and to make things balanced and, um, when I heard about the Hopi Indians and the sacred clowning, um, it just made so much sense that people had a whole troop of clowns that would be backwards and, um, you know, say and do uncouth things uh, to make light of something that was, you know, um, poisonous in the community, uh, bad leadership, whatever it was, mm -hmm. they would attack that thing and try to create some balance, right? And so people could 
see themselves in there. Am I for that or am I against that or do am I somewhere in between? And it's just a way to reevaluate, you know? So I think um, when you state the obvious, like I made a joke about, you know, the, the the woman with the black eye coming into the living room and her whole family is like all concerned and looking and could it be? And she's like, yeah, me and Richard are getting married. So it's just, <laughs> it's just like, you know, these dark sort of moments where we're just kind of like, man, we just have to laugh sometimes <laughs> or we will die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes, even when um, on on my reserve rod we saw Holt wakes, and uh, just the laughing that goes on in a wake is mm-hmm. just yeah, kind of it, I was about to you say. know we just laugh yeah. yeah and cry but laugh a lot. Like mm-hmm. yesterday, um, after the announcements with the the new measures, I had my COVID breakdown. Um, but so happened that I was meeting up with some friends over Zoom and we laughed and it felt so, so good that after hitting that wall, after crashing, you know, that low in the roller coaster, just going back up on there and just laughing and joking about what our situation is and just kind of bringing it back. And it felt so good. Like I, I felt reinvigorated and I was able to finish my evening without another tear shed. So... I, I, I really appreciate humor as part of the healing process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and there's like a physical release from that too, right? That, that like giant laughter. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we can touch on a bit of our imaginations now and <laughs> not that we weren't already, but bringing up um, our little scenario in the bush um yeah i'm gonna start with um uh, laurie do you want to start um sure what were the three things a book music and what else art. and art yeah <laughs> what else <laughs> my art or somebody else <laughs> anybody's yeah um book wise i think i would take eden can i take more than one book i would nope. take in robinson's <laughs> series um, music wise, I take Jim Pepper, who's from down south. He was Chickasaw. Um, mm, okay. As he's check him out, he's he's he passed away, but um, really good musician. I'm gonna check him out for sure. And art, I would take Rebecca Belmore's. I can't remember the title of the piece, but the one she had it in Athens, the the marble, the big marble. Um, tent. Oh, yes, as she calls it. Our home. So you get yeah. the out of that. You get like a so tent and art. <laughs> and I think an the, extra shelter. Yeah, the National Gallery owns that piece, right? I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we just had it. We just showed it in Abu Dhabi, actually. Yeah. So that's a great piece. There's even a hole at the top, so you yeah. can have like a little fire. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Skeena. Oh, what would I take? Uh, um, to be honest with you, the the music part, I, I have a hard time tapping into my musical tastes, to be honest with you. I'm all over the map. So I, I would bring a playlist, somebody else's playlist. <laughs> <Some cheaters. laughs> Just kidding. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Songs that I play over and over and over again, I guess, would be the Pixies. Yeah. I, there's that one track where there's like, oh, oh. I don't remember that song, but it's a great song. Look it up. Hey, I'm going to look I it up. How to describe what it was. <laughs> it's like a kind of like a 90s anthem for like skateboarding. Okay. Uh, and then I guess Toni Morrison's Beloved. I think I could read that over and over and feel like I'm getting something new out of it. It was a little dark as a film, but I identified so viscerally with it and the body, the, like the, the body language of the book like did something so deeply in me that I cannot describe how much healing I was able to get from that. 
uh, the way that she described the elder, there was a moment where she described the elder in the woods who was, mm -hmm. uh, I think, doing like a secret ceremony um, and everybody was wearing white and she she talked, she went through different body parts and she was telling them to love them, basically love themselves. And she held up her hands and she said, love your hands and clap your hands. And just the way that she described it, what just had me in tears. And I don't know any books that can really bring you to tears that much, mm -hmm. but I think it was something about having to have secret societies to survive. And I think that, you know, coming through the potlatch ban, I know that my family has um, so much unresolved grief being uh, det detached from so much mm -hmm. that when you can regain, uh, when you can regain anything, really, um, the ability to heal that pain is so needed and so basic it's it's a building blocks of your humanity so um being able to read how enslaved folks from our lands uh have the ability to try to heal what they went through i think it's very similar a lot of the detachment a lot of the violence is very similar to ours so i can really identify yeah um and art uh, I walked through the Vancouver Art Gallery and there was this huge sand pile it was looked like a building I don't know wh who the artist was uh exactly but he was he basically it could have been any kind of a British type building it looked like a residential school to me um and then he said that this building went through so many different uh, kind of internal business structures that it had the meaning changed so many times, changed hands so many times that the building was consistent and constant. And um, but it but it was slowly deteriorating. So the longer you stood in the room with this giant sandcastle, you would see these little pieces falling off wow. and degrading. And it just, like, I stood there, and even as I think of it now, uh, there's just something about change, just being able to change. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty powerful art piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagining, I can just imagine standing in front of it and watching all of the little pieces it's like the yeah kind of how we how we work too as humans little pieces yeah thank you for sharing that I work Ariane do you yeah, have I, I'm like you know alone in my home with two kids that I that I have to be the village for and so after more than a year I'm just, yeah, I am have so many things that need to be filled, you know, my cup is just constantly half empty, and then I have to fill it to get by. Yeah, I really oh. agree on that, Skeena. Um, and when it, I'm in Vancouver right now, because I'm here, it's my oldest son who lives here, and who just relocated here from the island in September, has to get knee surgery. Um, and in Winnipeg, I live alone. So, and I, my whole life's on Zoom with teaching. And um, so dry, I drove here. And so in the last, from, I left last Friday and I got here on Sunday, no Monday, but I got to see all four of my kids. Two of them are in Saskatoon. Uh, one's in Vancouver, uh, in Calgary, and then my oldest son's here. So, and I haven't seen them in over a year mm. they're all adults but um i i hear you about um feeling feeling that feeling of uh being empty i think i was very 
lucky and privileged to install a new installation at Plugin in January. So that really, that helped me a huge, because I don't know where I'd be right now if I didn't have um, that show to work on, that new installation, because I think as artists, we that's how we fill our cup and then we empty our cup and then we fill our cup. And I think I, I would be quite a, quite a mess too. And I think coming here has been very healing for me to, you know, my son's 33 and, you know, they don't really require me to take care of them anymore, but I get mm -hmm. to, you know, be a mother right now. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. We're all so displaced from our roles and the village is like virtual and it's just not, it's not right. <laughs> humans but need it's humans. Not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. No, my sister just moved into the bushes and I just feel like going with her. Um, she created a, her own home on her husband's territory and they have like, I don't know how many cabins, but they're building more and they're living off the land, off the grid, and it just sounds so good. And then my other family's like Northern Alberta and I have a smattering of family in Vancouver, but um, yeah, I'm kind of displaced and my communities are emaciated. So I don't know, finding a home within yourself and providing a village for your kids is just, it's difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But thank God I have friends. Yeah. Yeah, it's our it's our communities, our friends. We could I, I just like have to try to get used to like discomfort around grief myself sometimes, you know, like <laughs> I I I sometimes don't even know how to like respond to grief. And I think that in itself makes me feel like um you know, like I don't know, I just there's maybe I don't know what I think it was it's just a gift because that I just got from you because I realized that's something I need to like, um, yeah, figure out because um, it's 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 tough to hear other people's grief and like how to respond to people. And I wish we had more time. This always happens um, with top way talks, but you know, um, I I feel like my friend my friend said who was a midwife, I want to go to the bush. Just like you were saying, I just got that text this morning. She's a midwife and I'm like, well, babies are still going to be born, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to, or, or creativity will still happen. The need to make it and consume it and, and not as, you know, like, I guess, babies being born, you know, creation. And anyway, I just, I just like, it's so easy to, to like not, want to hang out in the grief or to like in somebody else's grief and I think that as like a whole like the whole world lots of us are exposed to people's grief that they've been dealing with through generation and generation and, gen and so many of us don't know how to receive it you know and how to like sit with it so I can like read it from a book but then my grief is contained in that book you know but when it's like a person like I I don't want to like lose that through COVID so that's my goal is to learn it and not lose it on how to receive you know other people's grief so I wanted to thank you for your like all of your just uh, like amazing I'm gonna go back and rewatch this it is recorded so people who what? just kidding <laughs> I'm just like I hope we mentioned that <laughs> you might want to cut off uh, all those other little little teary parts no way man <laughs> just actually you know what I cried I cried yesterday <laughs> in our in our in our dry run so I got my like tears out as much as possible then but you know it, it's been such a pleasure to like hang out and learn things about you both and learn things about myself by listening to you. 
Um, and I wanted to also thank Ariane for co-hosting uh, this month and for the beautiful opening that you gave and, uh, you know, just situating yourself here. We're on Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. That's like, that's where I am and it's virtual. So, um, and, a, and a shout out to Catherine Blackburn. I just want to like... Oh, I just got a pair of oh. drinks too. Oh, wow. awesome. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm grieving my jewelry because I haven't worn any of my jewelry. It's true. Anymore. This is the only time I get to wear my jewelry. <laughs> mm. So thank you both so much for your suggestions on art, books, and music. And I don't know if we have any questions, Ariane. One just, just came in, or it was more, I think it's more a comment. Uh, thank you, Skeena and Largi. Uh, good words. Jamie, your comment on how to respond to other people's grief is very honest, and thank you for that. And that's by Bay Heavy Shield. Mm. Oh, hey. nice. Hi, Bay. Hi, Bay. Hi, Bay. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, do you have anything? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say anything else. <laughs> We didn't do this for the rest of the time. But I'm just gonna say, plan this part. <laughs> thank God we don't have like a three second leg. It's pretty mm. immediate. When you're talking over each other and not wanting to step on each other, but there's a three second leg, it's the worst. Um, you know, yeah. we're fascia, right? We're we are all connected in some way, and uh, you know, our pain can be felt. Uh, we can feel each other's pain. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, uh, you know, our traditional communities had an ability to make things right and, and to acknowledge things and to deal with things. And, and we can get back there. You know what I mean? We can get back to that place. It's not over. Uh, just because we can't fix it in one generation doesn't mean we're failures, mm -hmm. you know, um, and just to acknowledge that whatever it takes for you to continue on, do it, you know, do what it takes. Make your art, make your music, uh, do your drawings, uh, cry, bathe, um, okay. make stuff, build things, whatever it takes. Unashamed, just do, just do it and stay here. Stay here. Mm -hmm. It's my virtual hug for you, Skeeta. <laughs> what about you, Lori? Do you have any parting words? Um, something that just listening to Skeena there for the moment um, that you said that kind of triggered this um, memory from last year when we were declared a pandemic, there was a bunch of us that went to the Sydney v and uh, Wanda and Anna Bush had put together a conference and, and it was when we landed, we found out that it was a global pandemic, but we still went on with the conference still went on um, but uh, Wanda had made a really beautiful comment about, you know, this is this this pandemic is when you think of Mother Earth and what's happening, all the planes, you know, being shut down, all the cars not driving, all the the ships not, you know, sailing and um, the stuff in canals <laughs> and yeah, and the stuff that went on, you know, the dolphins went back to Venice and, you know, the oceans were clean, the sky was clean. It was almost like this pandemic had caused Mother Earth a time to breathe. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a virus that, you know, affects our, our breathing as human beings. So that was, I thought that analogy that Wanda gave was really um, beautiful. And it's something I've really thought about over the last year. Yeah. And if Mother Earth is taking time to breathe, then that maybe can, you know, she's our role model, our lesson, or we are, you know, so I'll leave that with everybody, the viewers. And again, just to say thank you so much, Skina and Lori, and thank you, Ariane. And this is going to be recorded. There's other recorded ones you can check out and stay tuned for the next Tapway Talks. Thank you for inviting me, Jamie. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Nice to Tap see you. Tap away. <laughs> Tap away. <laughs>